Welcome to Truth Telling with Elizabeth D'Alto, the podcast dedicated to focusing on the truth that is always evolving within us and around us, where we explore the potentiality of truth as a highly esteemed value at a time in history when most people have more on their plates than any one human should. If you're new to me, full expression is my jam. Some words people have used to describe me range from speaker, trainer, coach, healer, writer, spiritual advisor, teacher, podcaster, and someone even called me their soul Sherpa once. I'm less concerned with titles or labels and more interested in results, change, and creating a world we want to, can, and are proud to live in. A kinder, gentler, more curious, collaborative, reverent world where people respect each other's backgrounds, experiences, and truths. They trust in themselves, in life, and recognize that we need each other. And they know how to cultivate healthy relationships to true power, not the very unhealthy kind of power our current culture is predicated upon. Speaking of our culture, there's a lot of noise and ignorance in our current culture, and this show aims to cut through that by exploring the truths of a diverse range of incredible voices, from authors, artists, creatives, and educators, to activists, speakers, and those in various scientific and esoteric fields, our guests hail from cultures and countries all over the world. We post a new interview every Monday, and if you want to keep up with the show notes and quotes from our guests, you can follow me on Instagram, at Elizabeth D'Alto. You can expect a wide range of topics when you tune into this show. Everything from health, communication, money, success, parenting, desire, sex, love, and spirituality, to making pivots and transitions in life, and topics related to psychology, storytelling, gender and race issues, emotional intelligence, activism, advocacy, and much more. A few disclaimers, no episode of the show is meant for everyone, and every episode is meant for whoever needs it on the right day at the right time. Not all guest views will reflect my own, and that's intentional. We don't learn, grow, heal, or improve by staying in our comfortable bubbles with all of our people who look, think, or live exactly how we do. If you love what you hear and find it useful and inspiring, the best way to show your appreciation is to share the episode, subscribe to the show, and leave us a rating and review wherever you listen in from. Thank you so, so much for being here with me. Here we go. Welcome to episode number 252 of Truth Telling with Elizabeth D'Alto. Before I dive into today's guest and what we're jamming about, I want to make a quick announcement to let you all know that if you're listening here in real time on Monday, April 30th, or any time this week before May 5th, I am having a Wild Soul Movement virtual program 1.0 retirement celebration sale. When I say 1.0, I mean that I am retiring my Wild Soul Movement virtual program as we have known it since 2013 and 2014 when I originally launched it out into the world. There's a lot of growth happening over here, some changes, some new things that are being called for to be updated in the program. And I'm taking it into the lab, meaning that I'm going to be teaching a lot more live classes in the greater Los Angeles area, as well as a couple other places this year as I travel. So if you want to know more about that, you can head on over to wildsoulmovement.com forward slash one. That's wildsoulmovement.com forward slash O-N-E. And you can get all the details on that. I've basically packaged up every single session of Wild Soul Movement that I've done since 2014, which is 48 movement practice videos, a digital journal, a private member area, healing mantras, video lessons, guided meditations, all kinds of juicy stuff for a really silly price. So again, head on over to wildsoulmovement.com forward slash one if you'd like to grab that before it goes off the market for good on May 5th. Now for today's guest, Shanti Das is a music industry vet and the founder of the Hip Hop Professional Foundation. The mission there is to empower and enrich the lives of those in underserved communities around mental health, youth empowerment, and poverty. Shanti's big truth was around owning her own truth. In this episode, we talked about knowing when to walk away and when you don't actually have to deal with things. We got into her opinion on the topic of appropriation in hip hop culture her transition from a high-powered executive to servant leader, and the role that her own battle with depression played in that. We got into the distinction between mental health and mental wellness and brain health, and I really loved that. We talked about digital social responsibility 
And she did not mind when I lost my shit over her close relationship with the members of one of my favorite groups of all time, TLC, as well as some other hip-hop and R&B legends from the 90s who will always, always have my heart. This is both a fun and important episode. The show notes are over at untameyourself.com forward slash episode dash 252. Um, I want you to enjoy this. I want you to share this. And also... Shanti is hosting National Silence the Shame Day this Saturday. Again, if you're listening in real time, May 5th, 2018. You can check it out by looking up the hashtag Silence the Shame. You can also text silence to 707070 to donate and help create programs and increase resources for mental health in those underserved communities. So thank you so, so much. And let's get into today's show. Shanti, I'm so happy you're here. Thank you. I'm excited to be here, Liz. There's so many things I can't wait to ask you about, but we have one question that we start everyone with, which is, what is a truth that's having a big impact on your life right now? I think one truth that's having probably the biggest impact on my life is me owning my truth. Me really finally dealing with the depression um, that's been there for so many years as a result of my dad's suicide. And so here I am, you know, 27 years in the entertainment industry, had an amazing career. But my truth is that I'm standing up to what happened in my past and not trying to bury it anymore. Mm-hmm. And I'm using that pain for good and trying to help other people. So really you, excited. You really are. You are helping people in a massive, massive way. So Thank you. I want to talk about that. But I, I do want to talk about talk about your career. I love hip hop, by the way. So when we connected and I saw that your company was Hip Hop Professional Foundation and what Mm -hmm. you're doing to help youth and empowerment and mental illness and underserved communities, I was like, oh my God, how is she using hip hop (laughs) to do this? I need to know everything. So I don't usually ask people to just share their background or share their story, but because you and I haven't connected before and I don't know it, I am going to ask you to do that. Okay, so kind of in a nutshell, um, went to Syracuse University. I had a college radio show, so I got into hip hop in the late '80s, early '90s, and when it was uh, the best. Oh my God, are you kidding me? And it was just diverse. You know, you had so yeah, a lot of hip hop artists, solo artists, female MCs, and so. Long story short, um, I just became like this B girl and started interviewing a lot of hip hop artists back then, and I started interning at Capitol Records, and that's where I got my shot. Right out of college, after Syracuse, I worked at LaFace Records, and the first record I ever worked was Outcast Players Ball. No. So, <laughs> I mean, that's that's like a, your like biggest dream, right? To be able to work with a group like Outcast, and having worked their very first record was pretty special. And so, fast forward, I got to work and do the marketing and promotions on four of their albums up until Sangonia. And I worked my way up from intern to executive vice president. And I worked at, you know, of course, LaFace Records. And I also got to work with Usher and TLC and Outkast. Wait, then I moved I'm to- going to die. You did not <laughs> work with TLC. I did. I, I did. I did their promotions. And then I eventually was doing their marketing. Yeah. When I, people who listen to the show have probably heard this story. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy Sexy Cool shaped my yes. life in in so many different ways, but- Literally, I was in the sixth grade. That was 1994 when that album came out, right? I feel so old. And <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> their abs, I was like, how um, do they get their stomachs? Like, that's when I started working out. And I was this fitness crazy. enthusiast. And I became a personal trainer eventually, like, <laughs> because of that album. <laughs> Are you serious? That's great. I, yeah, I even made my mom. We searched everywhere, like... I just yeah. wanted those like colorful, beautiful silk pajamas like they wear oh, in the cream like, video. Cream. I couldn't yeah. find them anywhere. To this so day, I, I still you, want those pajamas. Can I tell you, I was on the tour bus. No. On crazy no. Yeah. Bottom bunk, sleeping in the back by the motor. <laughs> but I love every bit of it. So I had to set up like all of their meet and greets. And oh, you know, I just worked God. closely with the girls. Yeah, it was an awesome experience. <sighs> and then, I, of course, I worked on fan mail. So... Those were the two major albums that I worked with the girls. And no they stress. used to call me um, sometimes a fourth member TLC because I was pretty short and I had a little washboard stomach back then. I don't know. I didn't show it as much, but yeah. <laughs> Shanti, I am <laughs> freaking out right now. I will forever. Like T-Boz and I are still best friends. No. I love, I love Chili. I get to see her periodically because oh. she lives in Atlanta. Yeah. Oh, my God. I can't even. Everyone on yeah, the they- show knows I do not really fangirl. <laughs> 
but I am losing my mind right now. So I'm going to have to surprise you one day, but we'll save that. Yeah, we'll do stuff. I can't later. even breathe. This is so great. So what what is that like, though, at that time, at that age, with the music industry being the way it was? How old were you at the time when you were doing that? So at the time, I was probably 25, maybe? Mm-hmm. 26. So, I mean, it was the time of my life. I mean, are you kidding me? I was working for one of the largest record companies on the planet because even though LaFace was, um, you know, we were distributed through BMG and we were sister company to Arista, we felt like a major label because we were producing so much quality product and all of our artists were pretty much at the top of the chart. So, you know, the private planes, the parties, I mean, working for LA Reed and Babyface and then comes a young man named Usher then comes TLs, I mean, uh, Tony Braxton. So it's just, you know, it was the time of the life. What yeah. was it like to see these people be like, oh, this new person, and then poof, they just become this phenomenon? So the one cool thing that I always say um, is LA and Babyface were like perfectionists. And the one cool thing about them is no matter how much money we put into marketing and promotion, it was still always about the music. Yeah. So that was one of the most magical things for me was getting to be in the studio and actually hearing some of this music before the rest of the world got to hear it. So wow. it was a really special time, like artist development, rehearsals, you know, we did all of that. You know, yeah. my day would start at like 10 in the morning. We would have a company dinner later. Then you go to the studio. Then I would go to the club, making sure people were playing it. I mean, it was nonstop, but I wouldn't trade it for the world. It was uh, it was awesome. So I recently had, uh, not recently, a couple months back, had an artist on, a musician on the show named Trevor Hall. I, I, I uh-huh. wasn't really into his music. I'm still not really into his music. Not that there's anything wrong with it. It just wasn't really my jam. But I was so curious. Yeah. He was doing this really unconventional record release. Uh-huh. And it, this is, I'm connecting dots here and I'm... I'm now that I hear that you were in the studios, did you have like favorite songs that you expected would be like the hits and then most people never even heard of them? Like, I think that's fascinating how like a whole album happens and then like three songs become really popular. Because <laughs> because I even think of TLC on Crazy Sexy Cool, um, Switch uh, oh my God, was one yeah. of my favorite songs and that was never mm-hmm. on the radio. And yep. then there was, I'm thinking of like, I, it was like number 15 or 16 and I'm not remembering the name of it, but there was another song that like was never on the radio. That was like my freaking favorite. And so I, what yeah. is that like behind the scenes? And you're like, I love this song. And then no one ever listens to it or you don't I mean, hear I, about it. So I, I, no, I think album cuts are beautiful, right? Because like you said, they don't really get to see the light of the day, but they kind of hit you at your core. Yeah. And that's the beauty of music. Like, I, you know, people always say that albums are the song tracks to our lives, right? So yes. there's always that one particular song yes. that may stand out. Like for <laughs> me, I love Digging On You. And Digging On You eventually made it to the radio, yes. but it wasn't like their huge, huge hit. Yes. But that was just such a massive groove. So and it just good. spoke to me in so many ways. Um, but yeah, I think we've kind of, it's a little bit of a lost art now. Because even though you have mixtapes, everybody can hear them, right? So there mm-hmm. are no like secret tracks, you know, that you can kind of like hold and keep close, you know, to the vest because everything you can hear, everything is released at the same time. There's no kind of reveal like it used to be. But album tracks were pretty special back in the day. That's so amazing. What a yeah. what a cool thing. And so so you mentioned how where where is it in the timeline of all of this happening when your dad committed suicide? So that actually happened when I was seven months old. Okay. So I was a baby, okay. um, but it was like a cloud over my life. I was embarrassed to tell my friends, you know, when you're young and, you know, kids ask about your family or you're like at a birthday party and someone is like, where's your dad? So I just used to kind of avoid those questions and I was embarrassed and wouldn't really talk about it. So I became like this, um, and I wasn't an introvert. I kind of buried all those feelings, but just became like this uber successful kid and was very focused and driven. But all of those feelings of kind of like depression and stuff started coming back once I started achieving success in their entertainment business, because money isn't everything. And we know that it's good. You need it. But, you know, it doesn't cut to the core, you know, and and really make you who you are. Yeah. So how did how did it and when did it start to come up and out that you realized you had to deal with it? You had to do something about it. So I think the first time was when I was living in New York City. Um, LaFace Records had been sold back to BMG and L.A. moved to New York um, to work at Aris to replace Clive Davis. So I moved up to New York with him and took the job as senior director of marketing. 
But I was just not happy at the time at that job. And it had nothing to do with L.A. It was a new situation. It was more corporate. My direct report at the time was like a yeller, very condescending. You know, he was a male counterpart. Um, None of the Me Too stuff with him, but it was just very tough working for him. Mm -hmm. Um, Not that I couldn't handle myself, but who wants to be in an environment where you're constantly being yelled at and degraded and talked down to? Like, it freaks me out. Yeah. I want to interrupt you for a second. Because even like what you just said, not that I couldn't handle myself, but who wants to do dot, dot, dot. I feel like this is a really important phrase and I'm pausing on it because I know there's so many people listening. You know, for a lot of women, we develop these people pleasing habits (laughs) or Mm -hmm. we think we need to suck something up and deal with it. And Mm -hmm. I, I love that you recognized like, of course I can deal with this, but why should I have to? Like who wants to do that? No. So I put up with it for like a year and a half. And then I remember just, um, and I never wanted to be a crier because, you know, in business, a woman crying, it shows a sign of weakness. So I always try to handle my situations, you know, behind the closed door, behind closed doors and to not let anyone see me sweat. However, that day I was crying uncontrollably at the airport. I was headed to Miami for an MTV shoot. And I just called my sister on the phone. I was like, I I can't do this anymore. And so I've never been a quitter. I don't like that term. But sometimes you have to know when to walk away. Mm -hmm. So I quit and walked away. And mind you, I had just sold my house in Atlanta. So New York was new for me. So I went back home and stayed on my friend's couch for the summer to kind of figure it out. And I got through it and, you know, picked myself back up and moved back to New York City, got a job at Columbia Records. Um, But, you know, I think the more successful that I got, the more I started rehashing the feelings of my dad and just trying to figure out who I am. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was kind of it was pre E pray love days. Right. So no one. Yeah, I think we were all just working so hard (laughs) trying to be successful, (laughs) but not really discovering self, if you will. Right. Yeah. So I think I was triggering all those feelings of I got, you know, I got the big house. I got the Range Rover. I got the corner office. I got the six figure plus, plus, plus salary. You know, what's next? And so I think some of those layers started being peeled back. And that's when I started experiencing more of my depression and I saw a therapist. And but it was in New York City when I first uttered the words, I think I want to kill myself. Mm. Now, the first time I did it, I think it was something that just rolled off of my tongue. But it scared me that I would even say those words because of the fact of what my dad had done. So fast forward, I left the entertainment industry in 2009 and I was at the height of my career. I was executive vice president at Universal Motown Records, moved back to Atlanta and just kind of gave myself some time to breathe a little bit. And my mom had developed Alzheimer's. So I really needed to get home. I was depressed about being away from her and just a bunch of other stuff. So long story short, move back home, I started doing a lot of community service work. And I was like, what is God trying to tell me? Like, why am I going through all of this? And, you know, I'm in so much pain, but I have a desire to help other people. And so, uh, of course, you know, there are a lot of women that still want to work in the entertainment industry. So at that time, I started mentoring a lot of young women at colleges. And so my girlfriend was like, why don't you write a book? And I was like, write a book? I can't write books. And so she was like, yes, you can just sit down and write your thoughts out. So I sat down one night, I was actually headed to Princeton to give a lecture um, on on women in hip hop. And uh, I wrote pretty much that entire night. And the next morning, I wrote all the way on the plane. So that's where the book, The Hip Hop Professional, came from. I wanted to brand myself as a hip hop professional. And that's a term that I coined and I trademarked it. And you might ask me, what is a hip hop professional? So a hip hop professional. Thank you. I like that you preempted (laughs) my question for me. Yes, yes. I was going to ask you that. No. A hip hop professional is someone that executes at the highest level at their job. So you could be a doctor, a lawyer, a scientist, a podcaster, um, also um, serves their community by giving back and doing community service work and just happens to love the culture. I'm still a big sneaker head. You know, I, I just still love so much about the culture. And I felt like hip hop is such a universal language. Now you can go to Tokyo, you can go to Stockholm, you know, you can go anywhere around the world. Even I was at the Western Wall, believe it or not, in Israel and saw these kids dabbing in in like a circle and a cipher. And I was like, holy crap, I can't believe these kids are like at the Western Wall, like all, you know, spitting and doing hip hop and stuff. So um, I just 
decided to embrace that part um, of my life and the culture and to use it um, to show kids that, you know, you can still become a rapper and do this and the, and the other, but you really need to make sure that you are performing at the highest level and that you care about the average person because so much of hip hop is, you know, braggadocious and, but not even just bragging, being confident, right? And, and getting the cars and getting the girls and so forth. We see a lot of that kind of played out in video and on social media. And I just want to make sure we kind of normalize that, bring it back a little bit and let people know, like, look, you still got to take care of your home. You got to take care of your parents. You got to take care of yourself. Don't quit school. Even if you want to be an artist, it's nice to have something to fall back on. You know, you can learn the business of the entertainment business so that you can have the right lawyers and, and accountants and so forth. So I just wanted to be someone that can help educate but still be like the cool kid. This so. is so great. I'm curious, just for your opinion on this, I don't know that there are right or wrong answers to this type of question, but how yep. do you feel about cultural appropriation? Like with, with hip hop being a culture, what is yeah. your feeling of people just kind of taking it and doing whatever they want? in various contexts? So that's a great question. And of course, it's been a hot topic, I think, on social media for quite some time. My opinion of it is, let's say, for example, Bruno Mars. Um, recently, a lot of people were um, kind of getting on him on social media about cultural appropriation. But my thing is, if you give praise and thanks to where the music the creativity and the IP originated, IP meaning intellectual property, it's nothing wrong with it. I am a Bruno Mars fan from day one. That kid always thanked Teddy Riley, um, a lot of other producers, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, uh, Bobby Brown. I've heard him thank so many other artists that came before him to say, look, I'm inspired by you guys. You know, I grew up listening to your music and this is my way to pay homage to you. When you do it that way, I don't see anything wrong with it. My problem with cultural appropriation, excuse me, is when, and I won't say any names, but you see certain people who take designs, whether it's clothing or direct bites from the music, and people use it and don't give credit where credit is due. And you act like it's something that you came up with. Right. That, that's not cool. But you, And unfortunately, we live in a society where if a certain celebrity is big enough and they kind of latch on to something and make it their own, then they're going to think, oh, this is something that they came up with. You got to just give credit to where it started. Yeah. Because um, that's the beauty about hip hop culture is so much is born within the culture, whether it's, you know, within uh, with fine art, with music. Uh, with fashion. I mean, look at what happened with Dapper Dan. I don't know if you're familiar with Dapper Dan, but he was um, a big clothing designer back in the day who used to outfit a lot of hip hop artists. Now, granted, some of the stuff that he made was like, um, he would take like a refurbished Louis Vuitton bag or Gucci bags and make it into like jogging suits. So a lot of the rappers wore it back in the day. And then he, eventually he got shut down, I think, by a lot of the high fashion houses, because I don't know how he was getting that stuff. So I'm not, <laughs> I'm not condoning that. But then to see some of those same fashion houses in the last couple of years start replicate, replicating a lot of the Dapper Dan designs, like that wasn't cool. So, you know, props to Gucci for finally doing a partnership with Dapper Dan and saying, look, we recognize how you were able to amplify the efforts of our brand and made it cool within the culture. Let's do something. And so they gave him his own fashion house now in Harlem. So he actually gets to, you know, outfit people using, you know, real Gucci material and, and through a partnership with the brand. So when you do something like that, I can give you props, but you, you just can't steal other people's stuff and act like you created it. Yeah. Not, and, not and, cool. You know, it's so interesting with social media being the way it is, people don't know even where to give credit. So I feel like no. sometimes people are, they're not even trying to do that, but someone's going to go, oh, that's theirs. And even even before social media, it took me years to even know <laughs> that there was a Roberta Flack version of Killing Me Softly. <laughs> oh, that's I'm like, funny. That's a right, Lord Hill oh, song. You heard it was <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. Yeah, I mean, you know, one thing I will say is sometimes I feel like we can be hypersensitive about everything. I think that's just the culture that we live in. But once you find out something, you know, and you say, hey, look, it, I didn't know about it is, yeah. you know, no harm, no foul. You know, my apologies. Let me make sure that I shout out the person I need to or give props to that person. It's just about the acknowledgement, right? Yeah. But then if you're taking it a step further and you're actually reaping the benefits from a financial standpoint, that's when, you know, it gets tricky. And 
you know, folks get mad and yeah. lawsuits once, get Once thrown. money is being earned, that's when people get exactly. really upset, right? Exactly. So, but you got to give credit where credit is due. Yeah. I think that's just the solution to so many problems. Yep. <laughs> so many problems. So I want to I want to come to Silence the Shame Day, which is coming yes. up. So your interview is, if people are listening in real time, it's April 30th and Silence the Shame Day is happening on May 5th. And mm-hmm. you were telling me a little bit about it. Last year was the first one, right? It was. So Silence the Shame was actually born in 2015. It kind of rolled off of my tongue in a radio interview that I was doing in Atlanta, Georgia. And I had been going through my own depression the last few years because, you know, it's a lot of pressure um, trying to convince yourself like, okay, knowing that you were this high powered executive, but now you're like totally transforming your life to be a servant leader. Very, very difficult. Um, And so I've had my own struggles for the last few years, but again, Silence of Shame was born. And so we've been doing these wonderful panel discussions. So technically it's like our one year anniversary because we did an official launch in May of 2017. We've done panel discussions in Bermuda, all over the country. We did one in Silicon Valley. Um, we've done them at like the A3C convention. We're also partnering now with Music Cares. Uh, I am doing something with the NFL Players Association and the NFL where I'm hosting um, a forum that they're putting together on mental wellness. So I'm just grateful that I have this platform now. I'm not embarrassed. As I mentioned earlier, this is my truth. I am owning it. I think that's the beauty of once you get to a certain place in your life, you realize like what's most important to you, um, like peace and love. And I mean, not to sound corny, but like, I just want to help people. I want to, you know, not have any drama with anybody, um, and live the best life that I can right now. And that's what silence to shame represents to me as we continue to get folks to talk about mental health and mental wellness and not be ashamed to talk about it. And so is that the big goal, like to get people to talk about it and not Mm -hmm. feel ashamed of it? Yep. So our our main mission is to peel back the layers of shame and stigma around mental health um, and to produce um, panel discussions, uh, amazing programs that we can take into the schools, increase resources for those in Mm -hmm. underserved communities and underserved populations. I mean, we really want to take this thing around the world because it's so bad in other countries um, like Africa and Japan. You know, it's really hush hush and you can't talk about it. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done to erase the stigma on a global perspective. Um, I think this is so important. I haven't had a ton of people talk about mental wellness slash mental illness. And I even like that you called it mental wellness. Is that a specific Mm -hmm. intention instead of calling it mental illness? It is because, you know, some words matter, right? And so for some people, um, I think that stigma, when you say mental illness, it still makes it like people cringe a little bit and it's a tough situation or tough topic rather to talk about it. So I like to say things like brain health, Mm. mental wealth, you know, mental wellness, because mental wellness, what people don't understand is your mental and your physical go hand in hand. It's all in your brain, right? So if something's wrong with your brain, you may not even be able to walk or talk either. So if, if your brain has certain things that triggers your mobile abilities, why do you get so bent out of shape when it's something that you know, you think like, oh, my, something's wrong with my mind, but it's all connected. And some cases are more severe than others, but it could just be a situation that's stressing you out at work that leads to anxiety that could then lead to depression. We're just trying to educate people so they understand everything about brain health and brain wealth so that they can look at it differently and that they can remove that stigma. It's, it's so amazing because, I mean, obviously it's, it's proven, it's talked about so much that what exacerbates it is the shame. People burying it, people hiding, people feeling like mm-hmm. they can't talk to anyone. And and how many people have to either lose a life or lose a loved one for someone to be like, I wish they would have told me, whereas exactly. the person had no idea that they could have. Exactly. And, and whether you've experienced something traumatic like cancer or a sexual abuse or the loss of a loved one, all of those can be triggers, right, yeah. that could lead to mental health concerns. And so I, I look at mental wellness as, you know, in addition to seeing a licensed healthcare professional, it's about the foods that you eat, mm-hmm. the exercise, you know, the mindfulness, waking up, you know, giving gratitude or praying or whatever you seem to do in the morning. Um, there's so many things that we can do that makes us happy, right? That gets those endorphins going. You walk outside, you see the vitamin D, the sunshine clearly puts you in a better mood. So it's like, it's almost like from a holistic approach, but also incorporating, you know, Western practices of medicine. To me, you need them all, you know, 
to make it work. Yeah. I really want to know what are these experiences of the panel discussions like? So, um, so we, the ones that we did with the teens were interesting because that is such a t- uh, heavy topic for mm-hmm. teens to talk about. But I was really impressed with some of the teens. One of the things that we did was we allowed them to answer, to ask questions, but to write them down on cards Smart. so that they can rena- remain anonymous. Mm. But I got to tell you, some of the questions that were asked, it was like we opened up the floodgates, like people started talking and responding. And one thing I can tell you is it's a lot going on in the world right now, even in our own country. And these kids, I think people in the jobs, it's, the pressure is heavy. Um, I think specifically with millennials, we had a really great um, panel discussion in February around millennials and mental health. And the one thing that kept coming up is this idea of perfectionism mm-hmm. and millennials wanting to be so successful and so perfect. And you're scrolling through everybody's timeline, looking at their highlight reel and thinking that your life has to be perfect and it has to be this way. So as a result, that's why you're finding more college kids that are needing to seek counseling. They're stressed out. You know, their suicidal ideation. You know, all of this comes from this notion of perfectionism. And so I think these panel discussions have really been helpful. And that's why we're really trying to raise funds so that we can keep this conversation going. We are starting a um, college campus ambassador program. So we're getting cool. Silence of Shame reps. So it was so cool. Uh, you can check my Instagram the other day. There was a, a historically black college. We have a rep in North Carolina. They had this really neat. Um, it was almost like a poetry slam. And so these kids were beatboxing and talking about learning how to silence the shame. And it almost brought me to tears mm-hmm. because I was like, oh, my God, like I'm getting these kids to open up about their frustrations and how they can cope during finals or just being away from home or not having enough money for school. But they can talk about their feelings and get it out into the open. So it was a great mental wellness practice um, in a kind of a non-traditional way using hip hop. like so, And using their art, right? Because yeah, completely. it makes it easy. It almost makes it easier to share if it's in the context of art than like exactly. sitting around talking with your friends. So brilliant. Exactly. So that's what we want to do is to create more programs like that that we can actually take into the schools and, you know, create the awareness that's needed out there. Do you know Kate Fagan? Have you ever heard of her? No, I haven't. She is an anchor and a writer for ESPN. She does a lot with ESPNW. She wrote a book. I went to a writing retreat with her and her partner, Catherine Budig, Uh in um, January. It was yoga and writing, storytelling. And Kate wrote a book last year. I'm pretty sure the title of it is What Made Maddie Run? about Mm -hmm. a freshman at UPenn who was like track star, perfect Instagram feed, everything going for her, you would think, and she committed suicide. Oh, no. She jumped off the roof of a parking garage. Wait, you know what? I think I might have read about her. Yeah, yeah. And and so Kate's been doing a lot of a lot of work, a lot of awareness and things like that. I'll I'll connect you to I would love to talk after the interview. So I forgot to tell you also my book is coming out. Yes. I wrote a short book. It's not a long book, but it's enough that tells my story of, you know, dealing with my dad's depression and my own suicidal ideation. It's called Silencing My Shame. I like it. So it's coming out in May. Great. So everyone listening, you can check that out too. Silencing My Shame. I'm just writing it down so I can remember when I can get it. Yeah. And this is something, this is one of those things that I've never really dealt with. Like I've, everyone gets depressed here and there. You have a breakup or you have a hard time or something traumatic happens and you deal with it. But this as as a recurring thing or as a really like deep thing, um, not really something I've dealt with. So it- Which is great. Yeah. Right. But it just feels so many people do. I've run so many programs. I've worked with so many women and, and this Mm -hmm. is the norm. And this is something I've had a partner um, who really Mm -hmm. dealt with a lot of these things. And Mm -hmm. I feel like I've also seen the damage when people don't know that Mm -hmm. that's what's going on. And they are like, again, our culture, it's so digital. It's so social media. You're looking around at everyone else's seemingly perfect life. And it's, Mm -hmm. it's already making the intensity of what you feel more intense because you're then on top of it going, what's wrong with me? Because you're comparing. So it just, it feels really important to be bringing awareness, discussing, learning. There's so much I don't know about it. So to have people like you here, I am curious as someone who does a lot of facilitating, does a lot of deep work and does work with people around trauma. I've done a lot of training in that. Um, Oh, really? 
Yeah. Um, oh, wow. Everyone has trauma, you know? Like, yeah. no one escapes yeah. with no trauma. I mean, the no scale, one is immune to it. The scale of trauma, it's a wide range and wide variety, but in yeah. my, it was unavoidable in my work. When I started doing women's empowerment type stuff and body yeah. oriented things, like, I had to learn about trauma. But um, when you host these panel discussions, do you have a therapist? Do you have someone like, how, how are you holding that space in like a safe way because there's so much potential for triggers? Yeah. So, uh, first and foremost, um, my foundation is the hip hop professional foundation. The movement is silence to shame. We never claim to be licensed healthcare professionals. Right, right. All we're trying to do is start the conversation. So we always have at least two, uh, therapists, licensed clinical, uh, professionals. Uh, we also have, um, psychiatrists because a lot, a lot of people don't know the difference between a psychiatrist and a psychologist. A psychiatrist can, um, recommend and administer medication, a psychologist cannot, which is more like a therapist. And then sometimes we'll have a mindfulness coach on the panel. Mm-hmm. Um, we may have a mental wellness advocate, someone who has, you know, experienced a sen- serious mental health disorder, but is now in recovering and doing great, you know, and out speaking and sharing their story. So that's the way we make it a safe place and space space. And so in, even in some of our markets, we'll have representatives like from Mental Health America or NAMI or like the Georgia Department of Behavioral Health. They'll have professionals on hand in case there is a quote unquote crisis that yeah. comes up. Um, in a couple of our panels, we had a few teens that had to deal with some really um, serious issues right on the spot. Mm-hmm. So we made sure that we had some professionals that could take them into a private room to talk awesome. right there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's, you know, I think it's amazing. And, you know, I've also had to look at this as a person with a podcast. I start a lot of conversations mm-hmm. and I, I often wonder what is my responsibility for beyond the conversation? Because when we start conversations, we're really opening up a yeah. lot of things for a lot of people that will need much more care and attention beyond the conversation. Absolutely. Um, and so again, like we provide resources on our website, yeah. um, whenever we do the panel discussions, we have a lot of pamphlets. Like I always try to like surf the web to get great information, mm-hmm. like from the Mayo Clinic. Um, we are partners with Emory's Brain Health Center. So we try to get information from those guys, the American Psychiatric Association. Um, so the good news is that we're starting to get attention from a lot of, you know, respected organizations on the clinical side. They see the advocacy work that we're out there doing in the community, especially getting um, in areas um, with people of color and some of the underserved communities and populations. And so we're excited about our future and the potential. Uh, We also just um, shot our first piece of content. It's um, we're going to do like these five minute webisodes around teen depression. Mm. And so, yeah, we're just trying to, to create as much awareness as we can align with a lot of other amazing organizations and keep spreading the message. So it's so amazing and it's so valuable and it's so important because I feel like a lot of the work I do is I call it basically reparenting adults. Mm-hmm. But you're mm-hmm. you're catching, for lack of a better word, people before they have to be in like their mid to late 20s or even 30s and 40s where they've done kind of like what you described, Right. Mm -hmm. Everything is good on paper. They have the good on paper life. I'm successful. I got the money. I got the thing, if that's the case. And then they're like, why am I still not happy? I feel like that's the case for so many people. So amazing that you're like hitting it up before they could even have all that unfold. Yeah, because I, you know, it's it's a little um, frightening at times, bearing your soul, right? Mm -hmm. And sharing some of your most vulnerable pieces and parts of your life. But I really feel like, because I'm a really spiritual person, And I'm okay with opening up and sharing because, you know, I had the big job, the big career, and and it was amazing. Don't get me wrong. But if I can share and help others that may have experienced some of the same things that I was going through and hopefully have a different outcome for them, then I feel like, you know, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. How has what you do now and this advocacy work and, you know, anything we do for others is obviously secondarily going to be rewarding for ourselves as well because we feel useful. How is that contributing to your own ongoing healing process? Because it's always ongoing. It is. (laughs) I'm glad you said that too, because um, since I've been doing a lot of the silence to shame work for the past year, um, it's been a lot of 
pressure on me. Mm -hmm. And of course, having to rehash those stories of my father's suicide. And I didn't even tell you that my best friend committed suicide four years ago. So that's another story. Um, So it's a lot of pressure rehashing that. And um, I I also have, we have a podcast called Silence to Shame. Um, We're about 14 episodes in. So we recently did one where my pastor was on there and he, he brought up this term. um, He didn't coin the phrase, but it's, I think a gentleman from Japan coined it, but it's called the wounded healer. Yep. And so oftentimes I feel like I am still wounded, but so I have to make sure that I'm doing the self care that I need to do on a regular basis at the same time that I'm trying to help and heal others because it gets to be a lot at times. So it's okay. It's okay when I know that I need to pull back a little bit and kind of lean on some of my committee members, you know, or my board members now, because I still got to take care of Shanti. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm excited that I found a new therapist. Um, I really, really like him. Um, and so I think that's going to really help me along this journey. I think therapy will be something that I'll probably do for the rest of my life, just from a wellness standpoint, just like I go to the chiropractor for, from a wellness perspective, I don't think it's anything wrong with going to therapy. It's like, you go get, you go get your cleaners, you go to the grocery store, you go see a therapist. I want to kind of add it into yeah. my daily routine and let people know it's okay. And since I've been opening up and sharing, you know, some people have hit me on direct message or sent me a really nice email saying, you know, I've been going to therapy for years, never shared it, but it's helped my life tremendously. And they didn't even suffer from depression or anxiety or anything, but just having someone to talk to from an objective standpoint and kind of help you navigate. through It's the biggest thing. I have so many friends who are like coaches and healers and they're amazing, but they're attached. They love you. They mm-hmm. have an, an opinion or a view or, or a vision for you. And they mm-hmm. like talking to someone objective is so amazing. It is. And the one thing I'll tell people that if you've ever tried therapy and it wasn't so great for you, sometimes it's, it's like dating, right? Yes. You, if you're swiping on Tinder, you go on a couple of dates, you know, there's a couple of frogs out there. You got to keep scrolling till you find your prints. Well, hello. <laughs> Same analogy with therapy. Sometimes it takes four or five tries before you can find, you know, the person that really resonates with you. And I've also found that sometimes it does help from a cultural standpoint um, that you get someone that can relate to you and your culture. Um, yes. So I just I just say to people, like, don't give up um, and don't be don't knock it till you try it. You know what I mean? Because yeah. it could be a good thing. I'm really glad you brought up the point about from a cultural standpoint, people can relate to your entire experience. And actually, and I don't don't even mean just black and white, right? No, a lot of people in this world just everything is so black and white, unfortunately. But I've had I've heard stories where you know they someone had an Indian psychiatrist or psychologist, and then they happened to be African American, but they just couldn't relate because. They didn't know the plight of those from the underserved communities and some of the stuff just was foreign to them. So they ended up having to find an African-American therapist. But or I know people that said, OK, they would prefer someone that's not, you know, within their same race and culture so that there is complete objectivity. So mm-hmm. it really just depends. So I just say you got to find the right person that works for you, period. I don't care what race, nationality, color, creed they are. Find someone that understands you and allows you to kind of talk through your stuff and and makes you feel better about yourself. This is not a thing I've thought about, like the different degrees of objectivity. There's the objectivity of someone just doesn't know you. They're not attached to your stuff. There's the objectivity of maybe they are familiar with their culture or they're not or your lifestyle or they're not Mm -hmm. or, Mm -hmm. you know who who you are, what you do. Like there are celebrity therapists that have to be sensitive to people who are of course, higher of course. profile. There's just, I'm just having a little epiphany around the degrees of objectivity and like how specific that could be. And I'm glad you said that because having worked around celebrities for so long, um, I understand those sensitive sensitivities, mm-hmm. but at the same time, like sometimes I've been around <clears throat> some of my friends that aren't celebrities Um, or just even peers at events and they don't understand why certain things are affecting the celebrities the way they do. But that's a tough, tough life. Right. And so I tell people, you cannot judge until you've walked in someone's shoes. So you're right. It takes someone that's really delicate and that can handle those sensitivities because being in the limelight, it may seem great and everything and you have a lot of money, but 
why why do you see so many people suffering in entertainment? Yeah. You've seen so many entertainers, unfortunately, over ye- over the years that have committed suicide. And the pressure is like enormous and, and deafening at times. And so it takes someone special. And, and, and I applaud all of the entertainers that do recognize the importance of mental wellness and, and, and the importance of taking care of themselves. I've thought about this, especially because I live I live in LA. I moved out to Malibu. Um, I'm not going to ah, stay here. It's, it's amazing. Malibu. I recently, though, within, at the time that we're recording this, you can come visit between now and July because <laughs> when my lease is okay. up, I think I'm going to move to a place a little more central. I feel yep. very isolated out here, but I needed it at the time when I came out here. But, um, you know, you see celebrities all the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm someone who's always like, I would never approach a celebrity. Mm -hmm. I just wouldn't because what like that just they're they're with their family or they're having their day or like, what am I going to say? Like, I have no value to add other than being like, oh, my God, I love you know, like, (laughs) I love that movie. Like they've heard that a thousand times. It must be so boring for them. But I, something I have often wondered is when out about out and about in the world, there just must be this constant question of mm-hmm. whether or not people genuinely like you, care about you, have your interests mm-hmm. in mind, or whether they like want or need some, or think they can get something from you. That must be so hard. Yeah, and see, I'm no celebrity, but I felt like that at times. You know, having been a high profile music executive. Yeah. You know, I, sometimes I walk in the rooms and I'm like are you just speaking to me because I'm executive vice president or because I'm the right hand to this person at the label? Or do you genuinely care about me? Yeah. You know, when I lived in New York for 10 years, it was a great experience, but there were times where I really felt alone and I only had like a handful of friends that I really felt like I could call on if something personal, you know, happened. So it was just refreshing for me when I came back home and was able to like really be around a lot of my childhood friends because I felt like they genuinely, they didn't give a crap about where I worked and who I worked for and what I was doing. And the one thing also is when I was in those positions at those labels and, you know, the money was great and the concerts and flying around the world, I would include my personal friends in that life so that, you know, I didn't want them to think that I felt like I was better than them um, or that they were beneath me in any way. And so, yeah, you know, the entertainment industry can be tricky. It's even, you know, in, you know, Silicon Valley and amongst, you know, the, the folks that have startups and are making the big bucks, you know, I hate the way we, 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 um, we devalue human beings. Yeah. Yeah. Just based on, you know, how many number signs they have behind their name and so forth. And so that was the one thing that, you know, I felt like at times I was losing a little bit of my soul and I didn't want to become that person. You know, I always at the end of the day wanted to still be like this nice, sweet girl from the South. Yeah. Right. Not naive, but just the person that genuinely cared about people. Like The values. Yeah. Like that kind of stuff is, is important to me. Yeah. It's yeah, so fascinating. So. Thank you for sharing all of that because it, it's the dehumanization factor, right? It is. It's so easy. And especially... I feel like celebrity has really changed because of social media. It so has. like there are like because I have a podcast sometimes people meet me and they're like, "Oh my god, it's you." And I'm like, "Yeah. It's just me, you know?" Yeah. But that I imagine too for people who whether they're a musician or whether they're an actor, probably especially for actors, so much is a persona. So mm-hmm. much of who you're who people actually love isn't yeah. really you. Of course at not. At your core. That has to be really disorienting mentally and emotionally. Absolutely. But I'm I'm glad you mentioned the part about being a podcaster and getting recognized. So I often joke with one of my friends. I was like, I'm insta cool now because I I swear I'll be like in the most random places. Like I was in a fabric store minding my own business, a fabric store, right? Not like a retail (laughs) shop, a freaking fabric store buying fabric. And a guy comes up to me and he's like, oh, I follow you on Instagram. So a couple of lessons here, right? One, because of Instagram and we live in this very social world, you you always have to be mindful of of where you are in your surroundings. And I always try to pe- treat people with kindness and respect, right? So I'm I'm not famous. I'm kind of insta famous on a local level. <laughs> right. <laughs> that makes sense. Local to Atlanta, there are people <laughs> here <laughs> who may yeah, recognize but me. I, but I get that a lot <laughs> with people following me on Instagram. Yeah. But my point is I try to treat everyone with the same amount of respect. 
And, and, and everyone just wants to be acknowledged at the end of the day. Now, granted, I might not be able to stand there and hold a 20 minute conversation with someone. And if they want help, I'll tell them to email me or whatever. But, you know, you, you got to just be mindful of how you treat people. Even if you can't talk to say, oh, my God, thank you for, you know, the acknowledgement. That's awesome. You know, hit me up. I can't talk right now and, and just keep it moving. But I just I don't like how people let the, the fame, whether it's on social media or otherwise, you know, really get to them. And sometimes to their credit, they can't help it because they may not have the right people around them. That's why I think it's important that you always, no matter who you are, celebrity, non-celebrity, just try to surround yourself with people that really, truly care about you. Yeah. Um, again, like you said, sometimes you can't judge who wants to be in your place or space, but that's why having friends that you grew up with sometimes can help weed out a lot of that. Of folks that are just trying to get ahead and and opportunists, you know, as I like to say. Yeah. Um, so you got to try to make sure that your circle is tight and that you have a, a trustworthy circle. Yeah, and it's you know it's fascinating. I actually don't really have any friends who are people I grew up with, any close friends. Mm-hmm. I, I, I like changed and I moved so many times, but I do. I have this core now that I really have only established over the last three years, very intentionally. And mm-hmm. it is like it's also too people who will call you on your shit. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> if Hello. or when you are like, yeah. absolutely getting and it's a not little even beside about, yourself, a little beside yourself, and that yeah. doesn't necessarily mean like too big for your britches, although it could, I did it. but it could be I like the the myriad of ways any of us might lose ourselves, right? Of course, we're human, right? We're so human. We all make mistakes. Trust me. So, um, I love towards the end of the interview. You know, we talk about deep stuff, the amazing things that people do, but I like to keep it really human. And so I think one of the best ways to do that is I love asking people, what do they watch on TV if they do? Oh, yeah. (laughs) So I watch a lot of TV. I just watched a really great series that I binged called Seven Seconds on Netflix. Um, I am a Law & Order girl, so SBU, I love, I love Chicago Med. I love Chicago PD. Um, I don't know. I have a softy. For stuff like that, I think the compassion in my in my heart, um, just from everything that I've been through, I watched that. Uh, I love what is it, Big Little Lies? Oh, I never watched that, but I've heard it's amazing. Oh, That's on HBO. Gosh. It's so good. It's on HBO. Um, I also watch a show on Showtime called The Shy, mm-hmm. which is really great. Uh, Billions is awesome. Um, and okay, so my guilt, my one guilty pleasure. <laughs> You're like, the one I don't want to tell you I watch. <laughs> Have you ever seen the show Unreal on Lifetime? Uh-uh. So it's about the producers who produce a reality show. Okay. And it's so cutthroat and it's so wrong. <laughs> but I like it. What I mean, I all say? these things are so interesting. I had yeah. I, people on the show have heard me talk about this before. I had this meditation teacher, David G, on the podcast. Uh-huh. I mean, I uh-huh. think he was probably in our first 30 episodes. It was way back oh, wow. like 2015. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, as a, a spiritual guy who some people would even consider a guru, mm-hmm. he was talking about all this TV that he watches. And he's like, <laughs> it probably surprises a lot of people, but it helps me to keep my finger on the pulse of all these experiences I don't have access to, you know, Mm -hmm. he's a white guy living in Southern California for all intents and purposes. So like he lives and operates in a bubble because he works in Mm -hmm. like spiritual communities and is dealing Mm -hmm. with conscious and mindful people. So when he said that three years ago, it really gave me permission to just start (laughs) watching a ton of TV again. (laughs) I like it. It's also a way for me to kind of stay up on what's going on at oh. One of the other shows I love that the reboot with Will and Grace. Yes, um, I'm loving that. I swear it's like the show never ended. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a huge Jack fan. I hope to meet Jack. What up, Jack? I want to so meet you funny. one day. <laughs> it's like you missed them. Isn't it weird how we, these characters become like. Like we know them. They're like, like we know them. Yeah. It's, it's the same way as musicians, you yeah. know. Which is why it was so surreal for me when I got to work with Prince, because I felt like in my mind, <laughs> I already knew him. Oh, my goodness. Um, so that was like an aha moment. Funny that That's you say so- that right now, because last week, a friend of mine told me, I, I missed the boat on Prince, straight up. It's actually something I've been having serious mm. remorse it's about. Never too late. I know. It's not. I, I, I dove in last week, because my friend told me about this video where um, – it's a James Brown concert. It's 1983. This is the year I was born. The technology oh sucks. It's on YouTube. Yeah. You can find it. We'll put a link in the show notes for anyone who wants to watch it. Uh, okay. Um, 
Michael Jackson is there. So James Brown is like, what? I just heard Michael Jackson is here. Michael Jackson comes up. Michael Jackson's on the stage with James Brown, tells James Brown, whispers in his ear, Prince was there too. No way. Are you kidding so, me? So you got to watch this as soon as we get off. Just go, oh go on YouTube and type in Prince and Michael Jackson at the James Brown concert. Oh, I will. It'll come up. It's like a two minute video or something. Oh my like, gosh. Michael Jackson sings a little bit, then disappears. But then Prince comes up. First of all, he gets a pee back ride on this giant white dude up to the <laughs> stage. The guy drops him off. He's like, takes off. His, I don't remember if he already wasn't wearing a shirt or takes off a shirt. And he does like this Prince thing. His sexual energy and expression is like, <laughs> Off the charts, right? Oh, yeah. And so I went on a Prince binge last week. I was watching yes. like, everything. And I only put a dent. <laughs> like videos, interviews. There's like um, compilations on YouTube of like hilarious mm -hmm. Prince moments. <laughs> People telling their Prince stories. Like oh, I had my friends. Gosh. I made this Facebook post and I had friends what? commenting about the time she met Prince in LA and he offered to make her pancakes. I'm like, what? Oh my God. He's amazing. So you got to watch the movie Purple Rain if you've never I seen will it. Watch Purple Rain. Um, I, I actually got to do the marketing on the Musicology album. And so I went out and did like 12 concert wow. dates with him. Wow. And can I just tell you this? I was at the last concert in Atlanta where he performed before he passed away. No way. And I was, I was one of the probably last five to 10 people that he retweeted. No. Ever in life. I still have the retweet. I almost passed out that night because I was like, wow, I didn't know it because I hadn't uh, kept in touch with him and I hadn't seen him in quite some time. But I guess he still remembered me. So that was wow, pretty cool. So amazing. Yeah. So, I'm so I'm so glad you're doing the work that you're doing, that you're out in the world, that you're using your voice, that you have a platform and that you're getting to share. I feel like you have all these rich experiences. And oh, thank I you. really appreciate people like you who were able to synthesize their experiences and and use all the good and the bad and the mix of everything to like really help and really serve and really do things in a meaningful way. Like I'm sure all of your marketing background comes in handy when it's time oh, to God, like completely. spread your message, right? Exactly. It really so does. Amazing. So I, and so I'm glad you said that. Um hold on one sec my computer I gotta plug it in two seconds. Yep. So the reason the one thing I just want to end with I'm glad you said that about the marketing. The cool thing that I've tried to do with Silence to Shame is like market it like a new hip hop project I'm yeah. working. Yeah. So we have all the hand to hand materials. We have our podcasts. You know, we produce our events. They're like our concerts for us. You know, I'm getting a lot of um, celebrities on board. We, we get a lot of support from celebrities. And so I feel like I'm still kind of working in the music industry, just, you know, doing something different. So, so amazing. Yeah. I love it so yeah. much. We're going to put links to everything that matters, everything that we talked okay. about. Um, and that Prince video <laughs> yes. in the show notes, in the show notes, this was awesome. airing on April 30th. I don't remember the episode number, but it'll be in the intro. Shanti, you're okay. so amazing. Thank you so much Shanti, for your time. Thank you for sharing. Really, really appreciate you. Thank you. I can't wait to check out the rest of your podcast and I'm going to take you up. I'm coming to see you Come. when we get, when we get to Malibu, we're going to Jeffrey's because I love that view. I haven't been there. I'll save it for you. Oh, okay. All, All right. Good. good. Thanks. Bye. So like for, for the longest time, I wasn't comfortable. Like, so when I'm with the analyst people, I just talk about analysts, mm -hmm. analyzing data and all that. When I'm with the creative people, I talk about creative. I never mentioned the other part of me until the play happened, because then my coworkers came and watched the play. And were they and like, I, what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> they're always <laughs> like, they're like, wait, you're an analyst and what the heck? Like, how did you? <laughs> yeah. And then my actors and the like the people who were put helping me with the play knew I had a full time job that has nothing to do with with the play. Um, so yeah, that's when I was like, you know what? I'm done trying to like hide. I'm interested in all of that, and I'm yeah. doing all of that, and I'm okay with it, and it's okay in my standards and whatever. <laughs> leave I, me alone. <laughs> I appreciate that a lot. And so, and when you say leave me alone, did anyone actually bug you about it, or were or were you in no, your head feel, thinking that they would? Yeah, in my head or sometimes comments like, oh, you're doing too much or mm -hmm. slow down or stuff like that. And and I would sometimes think about it. I'm like, am I doing too much? Like, OK, yeah, I get I'm aware when I'm overwhelmed and I'm aware when I need to like prioritize. But I'm OK. Thank you. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm not doing too much. I want to do all this stuff and I'm still OK. Like, I'll I'll let you know when I can't handle it anymore. Yeah. yeah.